take a ride. What is up, Space Chickens? In case you didn't recognize the voice, this is Chris Arms filling in for Alien Photog. Poor guy lost his voice. What can we say? He's going to be out this show, but you got me. As a matter of fact, uh, he played me a clip of his voice. It's not pretty. He sounds like a lunch lady. The poor guy's sick, but I feel honored to fill in. Okay, we're just going to cut to the chase here and kick things off. A uh, lot to cover on today's show. We're going to get right into the Japan quake, the tsunami situation over there, news clips, theories on the causes, 2012, go over the recent earthquakes in Chile, Haiti, New Zealand, massive animal deaths, harp, sun activity, Fox's news warning of a nuclear meltdown, maybe even get into some of the uh, Jerusalem UFO sightings, possible hoaxes, weigh in on that. Again, this is Chris Arms filling in for Alien Photog. Thanks again for being with us. Let's kick it off. Now, unless you've been living under a rock, chances are you've probably heard about the situation going on in Japan. Japan launched a massive military rescue operation Saturday after the giant quake-fed tsunami killed hundreds of people and turned the northeastern coast into a swampy wasteland. Prime Minister Nato Khan said 50,000 troops would join the rescue efforts following Friday's 8.9 magnitude quake that unleashed one of the greatest disasters Japan has witnessed, a 23-foot tsunami that washed far inland over fields, smashing towns, airports, and highways in its way. So far, the official death toll stood at 413, while 780 84 people were missing and 1,128 injured. In addition, police said between 200 and 300 bodies were found along the coast in Sendai, the biggest city in the area near the quake's epicenter. An untold number of bodies were also believed to be buried in the rubble and debris, and rescue workers have still yet to reach the hardest hit areas. Adding to the worries is the damage at the Fukushima nuclear power plant, where two reactors have already lost cooling ability. Because of the overheating, a meltdown is possible at one of the reactors, said Rohi Shomi, an official with Japan's Nuclear Safety Commission. But even if there was a meltdown, it wouldn't affect people outside a six-mile radius, he said. Most of the 51,000 residents living within the danger area have already been evacuated. Since the quake, more than one million households have not had water, mostly concentrated in the northeast. The region continued to be jolted by tremors even 24 hours later. You know, just weighing in on this from another perspective, I'm hard-pressed to think of another Another time in history when I've seen so many earthquakes hit densely populated areas in succession. I mean, you got Haiti, New Zealand, Chile, now Japan. You can't help but wonder if it's all building towards something. You know, which kind of brings up another question. Is the earth actually in tune with the consciousness of its inhabitants? Are earthquakes simply a reaction to the direction that we're going? In fact, I'd love to see an experiment done where we get a massive group of people, have them think angry thoughts over an earthquake zone, just to see if anything happens. Of course, I'm kidding, but you never know. Also, how does this all tie into 2012? You know, I was theorizing this with our friendly host, Alien Photog, and we were talking about what's going to happen on 2012. And I brought up the point that, well, even if nothing happens, it's still going to be a major event. You take a look at all the media sensationalism, in movies, TV, newspapers that's been surrounding this event. What about those who say, wait, look, it's not an apocalypse, it's just the beginning of something new. Do we as a society have some deep need for storytelling or is there actual data behind this? You kind of have to ask yourself, well, what does that say about us? Is there data either way? And, you know, just tying it back into the earthquakes for a second, you can't help but wonder, I mean, is the rising cost of living causing an emotional state of its inhabitants, which in turn is causing these tectonic shifts? Wild theories, yes. And scientists would probably tell you otherwise, but that's just my theory. You know, at the same time, I can't help but wonder, I mean, does it take an event like a a massive earthquake, a massive um, explosion, a 9-11, something like that to dissolve the borders, to get us to wake up and realize, you know, we're all really connected. And when it comes to, when push comes to shove, you know, when our backs are really pushed to the wall, we really do reach out and help each other. And I can't help but wonder that, you know, we need a tragic event like this to actually bring us together. As doom and gloom as that sounds, if you look through history, those are the times and those are the events that when we're really, really stretched, we seem to connect. A lot of us get locked into our day jobs, the nine to five, and we don't have time to really think about what other people live like in other countries. 
Now, here's another interesting theory. If you type in the letters HARP, H-A-A-R-P, into Google, immediately following the search results, you'll see the words HARP Japan Earthquake. Now, for those of you who don't know what HARP is, it's a massive antenna array held inside a government installation in the wilderness of Alaska. Those who have worked there and government officials have been less than forthcoming about what goes on there, although it is widely reported that the installation is used for massive weather experiments. Confidential sources from within HARP's ranks actually report that the installation is used for massive weather experiments, which could explain the recent animal die-offs, earthquakes, and strange weather phenomena activity. Conspiracy theorists have already flocked to the web claiming that the massive Japan quake was caused by the installation. Now, these accusations can only be taken so far, but actually there is no scientific evidence other than testimony that HARP can or cannot create these types of events. That being said, call what you will, but economists are actually excited for this, including investors. Investors have poured into the global scope, stating that this is actually good for business, as Japan will need to rebuild and this will help businesses across the world bringing more jobs into the area. Investors actually look ahead, whether it's actually a hurricane or an earthquake disaster. Despite on the many lost in Japan, investors seem excited. Good news, but kind of grim considering we're only one day into the disaster. A man by the name of Benjamin Fulford in a recent newspaper article reports from Tokyo on a mysterious plasma weapon seen prior to the Niigata earthquake in July 2007 and red, white, and blue light seen prior to the recent earthquake in China. Both quakes targeted nuclear facilities. According to Benjamin, the next target will be the New Madrid fault line in the south midwestern United States. Unknown to many, the White House has already openly supported weather modification as a tool for defense. You know, to me, that's a pretty scary thought. I mean, to me, even if they have it right, why do we want them up there playing with the system that's billions of years old? On the other side of the argument, we have the realists claiming that it's simply a natural cycle, be it moon cycles, earth cycles, whatever you want to call it. It happened before and it will happen again. Now, if there is any good news to get from all this, it's that oil prices have dropped below $100 per barrel for the first time in more than a week. Japan is the third largest oil importer in the world. And now, it's really unclear how much the economy will be affected by the disaster, but the news helped down what had been a three-week rally in oil prices. Others theorize that Hart might actually be responsible for the recent honeybee disappearances and bird die-offs. But new evidence suggests that the German company Bayer might actually be the culprit responsible. Many groups have been accusing Bayer of marketing dangerous pesticides and thereby accepting the mass death of bees all over the world. Since 1991, Bayer has been producing the insecticide I'm Metachloroprid, which is one of the best-selling insecticides in the world. Often used as a seed dressing for maize and sunflower, Bayer exports the chemical to more than 120 countries, and the substance is Bayer's best-selling pesticide. Since patent protection for the substance has expired in most countries, Bayer in 2003 brought a similarly functioning successor product, Clothianidin, into the market. Both substances are systematic chemicals that work their way from the seed through the plant. The substances also get into the pollen and the nectar that can damage beneficial insects such as bees. Now here's the catch. The beginning of the marketing of the chemical clothianidin coincided with the occurrence of large-scale bee deaths in many European and American countries. Up to 70% of all the hives have been affected. In France alone, approximately 90 billion bees died within 10 years, reducing honey production up to 60%. Harrow Schultz, attorney of the Coalition Against Bear Dangerous, said, Quote, the public prosecutor needs to clarify which efforts Bayer undertook to prevent a ban of clothianidin after sales of both substances were stopped in France. We're suspecting that Bayer submitted flawed studies to play down the risks of pesticide residues in treated plants. In France, clothianidin has been banned as a seed dressing for sunflower since 1999 and in 2003 was also banned as a sweet corn treatment. The accusation of flawed studies is confirmed by the Canadian Pest Management Regulatory Agency or the PMRA, which judged on Bayer's clothianidin application. Quote, All field slash semi-field studies, however, were found to be deficient in design and conduct of the studies were therefore considered as supplemental information only. Clothianidin may pose a risk to honeybees and other pollinators if exposure occurs via pollen and nectar of crop plants grown from treated seeds. PRMA adds, it should also be noted that clothianidin is very persistent in soil with a high carryover of residues into the next growing season. Clothianidin is also mobile in soil. You know, the story actually mirrors...